I want to uh, ask you guys to join me in welcoming our next speaker, which is Dave Miller, who's the CSO of the firm Covicent. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that, that kind of is central in when, when we're talking about Internet of Things and security um, is identity and identity management. Um, and I think anybody who, just in their own personal life, is trying to manage um, user credentials and passwords across an increasing population of devices, uh, personal devices, uh, connected devices at home, uh, you know, uh, devices in the workplace, uh, understands sort of intuitively, uh, viscerally, um, the challenge that IoT and a population of tens of billions of these devices is going to, the, the stress that that's going to put on identity management uh, infrastructures. Frankly, it's not an area that in the enterprise space we did a great job with. Um, <laughs> and IoT kind of adds a couple zeros onto the end of the, um, on, uh, the device population. Um, so how do you do that? How do you both manage, how do you do, uh, manage identities in a way that's secure, uh, that's seamless, that's scalable? Um, that's flexible, um, and that's kind of what Covicent does. It's what Covicent helps companies with. Uh, they've got a platform with over um, 212,000 connected organizations on it, um, dealing and and not just or, you know organizations in vital critical industries, manufacturing, automotive, and so on. Um, Dave, as I said, is our CSO. Um, and he's um, responsible within Covicent for both um, internal and external systems architectures um, and uh, system, you know, system for uh, e-business um, uh, exchanges, they, their e-business, Covicent's e-business exchange. Um, he's somebody with decades of experience in the security industry with real domain expertise around identity management. Um, and he's going to hear, he's here talking to you um, uh, about um, the uh, IoT and the challenge of um, building a secure, critical infrastructure in, in IoT. So um, this is something that I think ties together a lot of the themes that we've been, we've been hearing about around security, critical infrastructure, um, and IoT. I want you to join me in welcoming Dave Miller uh, from Covicent to our stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. People can hear me, right? Yes, all right. <clears throat> Good, so uh, what's interesting about this presentation is uh, it was put together for me by, uh, by uh, some of my folks uh, back because uh, I spent two weeks in the middle of the woods in the last two weeks and had no connectivity. And when I saw the presentation, I decided there were too many words. <laughs> so I... I've nuked about 80% of the slides. <laughs> and instead, what I want to do is talk to you about some concepts. This has been a great conference. This is, this is interesting. Um, and I want to at least, uh, at the beginning, talk to you a little bit about Covicent. And this is mostly kind of a why do you guys have the pedigree to be talking at all about IoT just to start with, right? So just understand where we came from. I was one of the founders of the company in 2000. And the challenge that we were solving in 2000 was the fact that we had OEMs. I came from General Motors. Uh, and the OEMs wanted to be able to do direct communication with their suppliers. And they wanted to expose lots and lots of applications. This is exposing applications to suppliers. And the problem was we would like them to be able to go to one place, authenticate one time, right? not have a bunch of IDs and passwords. And I had pushed this since about the mid-90s at General Motors. And I remember having a discussion with a guy <clears throat> when we were originally talking about the ability to have one ID and password, which we still don't have. I would argue nobody here has one ID and password for their stuff. We're getting better. But one ID and password to be able to get into all these systems. And the guy I was talking to said, you know, that's great, Dave, but come on. What, I'm going to have what? six IDs maybe, I think I can remember six IDs. And I said, no, you're going to have over 100 IDs. And he told me I was nuts. There's no way that there's going to be over 100 systems out there that people are going to have to access. Now, we all know what has happened with that, right? This ability to go one place to manage identity, right? All of the things associated with that becomes a, has become a really important thing. I was at an IoT conference four months ago, North American IoT conference, where the big discussion was the difference between mesh networks 
and hub and spoke networks. And in the discussion I was having with a guy, he said, no, 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 the devices will seek out other devices that they can communicate with. And I said, no, that's gonna to be too complicated. What are you gonna do when there's a thousand devices that wanna to talk to my car? And he said, well, that's ridiculous, there's gonna be five. And that's all that there's gonna be, right? I guarantee you what, what we're gonna see is the same thing that we have seen in this identity management space. And I've always kind of been a, a student of history from a standpoint of looking back at what other folks have done previously and try to see how this, this has moved forward in, in new technology. So what I see here, which is great, right, is exactly where the identity management, identity federation space was 10 years ago, but for IoT, right? Except what I'm hearing is people actually taking it more seriously, right? Folks really were not taking that quite as seriously. So we have lots and lots of customers and we have gobs of organizations and identities and all of that that we manage, but, but what we managed up until four years ago was primarily the ability for a user to authenticate one place and share that authentication to lots and lots of other places. If anybody here uses uh, Carlson Wagenlick Travel to do their corporate travel, that's us. So you used our IDs, it's our ID that basically federated you in, right? Because we were automotive, the OEMs came back and said, look, it is great that our suppliers now have one ID to get to all of our stuff. It is great that our dealers now have one ID to get to everything. We've decided we want a relationship with our customers. We would like our customers to be able to have one ID to get to all of our internal stuff. So for General Motors, for example, we're on Star, but we're also the, also the owner databases, right? Or basically the owner portals. So if you're an owner of a GM vehicle, you have one experience, one ID, one password to be able to manage that car to do all that stuff, right? And that is kind of, a, right now it's our big thing, right? So it's an interesting concept, right? But what is missing in a lot of discussion in IoT, and, and some of the previous speakers didn't fall into this, but some did, is sometimes I go to these conferences and I believe it's the Internet of Thing conference. I'm going to talk about the thing, right? So I'm gonna talk about when I go to, to automobile conferences, it's the car, and I'm gonna talk about all the ways that a car can be hacked and why we have to secure that thing. If I go to healthcare conferences, we do a lot of health information exchanges. What I'm gonna talk about is how your pacemaker can be hacked or uh, how your MRI can be hacked, but it's Internet of Thing. That's not what it's going to be. This is where life is going to be different than what we did before with identity. So, in the identity world, it is truly, a, from a hacker standpoint, it is a point-to-point -point problem because the one endpoint is a human being and then there are system, 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 system. So you can either go directly against the system. So I'm gonna look for buffer overflows, I'm gonna look for network type of problems, right? Really look at infrastructure issues. Or what I'm going to do instead is I'm gonna hack the ecosystem. And in the IDM world, right, of carbon-based units, the ecosystem's me. And so what most hackers do is they hack the ecosystem. They hack me. And the way they hack me is they convince me to sign up for a service, right, that will send me funny Dilbert cartoons every single morning. But to sign up for the service, I need to create an ID and password. Please feel free to use your email address as your ID and pick any password that you would like to. What do people do? They pick the same password they pick everywhere else. You basically gave this guy your ID and password, and then he just basically goes off and he tries all kinds of other places. That's hacking the ecosystem. In Internet of Things, as we start to get to billions and billions and billions of devices, what's gonna happen is devices are gonna connect with devices. Things are all this going to happen. There's not gonna be human intervention here. My car, for example, is gonna have direct connectivity with the OEM. So one of the things that was talked about was the black box model. And one of the reasons why airlines are very, very safe is the black box does tell them every time something breaks, right? Every time, right? So not just instrumentation on the, 
landing and, the, and all of those things, but when a plane crashes, they can look and say, oh, we had a problem with ailerons. So we're gonna take a look at all of those, determine if we have to change the design. OEMs wanna to move towards that. What they would like to do on one side is have all the vehicles connected to them directly, doing basically the telematics, right, of everything that is happening on your car. What's your tire pressure levels, right? What is your uh, engine heat running at? What is your, uh, what is your uh, 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 rate of change of acceleration? How is it that you drive? Where is your environment? So that they can use big data to be able to, to either predict when things are going to break, right? Or if nothing else, do redesigns to say we consistently are seeing this thing break whenever it's a hot environment that people are driving in and they're younger and they accelerate a lot and so we know that we need to fix these things, right? Those things are going to happen without anybody knowing they're happening, right? Those are these data streams that are just going to, going to occur, right? The ability for my car to communicate with my connected home right, to do things like turn up my thermostat. So here's a good example of a simple use case, right, which is the use case, right, with, that everyone talks about, which is the wouldn't it be great if as I was driving home, my house was at the temperature I liked at the time that I walked in the door. That way, I, in the summertime when it's really, really hot, I could keep the house cool. And in the wintertime when it's really, really cold, which I think you guys in Boston know both of these things, you actually understand what hot and cold is, uh, um, it will be at the appropriate warmth weather, but I don't have to keep it there all the time. That's a complicated thing, right? There's a lot that has to be known to do that efficiently, right? Something has to know what the temperature in the house is. Something has to know how long it takes to get to the house from one temperature to another. Something has to know exactly where I am Something has to know the traffic that I'm going to be going through to know when I'm going to arrive, right? That is a complicated interaction that imagine it just occurs. And as human beings, the problem is, once things become automated and I don't have to be part of them anymore, I kind of forget that they're happening, right? And that's when security guys, right? That's what the hackers like, right? So, so breaking into systems that aren't monitored a lot becomes something that's a, that's a big deal. The, the way that I like looking at this as an ecosystem problem is this whole idea, right, of a building, right? So you see a big skyscraper, and I'm gonna, buildings have lots and lots of windows. Windows are an opportunity, right, both for security vulnerabilities, right? That's hacking, right? So I, I've often said this, right? Security is about keeping people out Privacy is about letting the right people in, okay? And that is an important kind of concept, right? And if you think about the windows on a building, right, that is an opportunity for, for egress into that building. But it also has a privacy issue to it. So we have to worry about the privacy of these things, right? Now, remember I told you I like examples that are real-world examples uh, of things? So let me give you a real-world example of this. Um, when I was an executive at General Motors, when we very first moved into the Rensen, any of you have been downtown Detroit, right? Right downtown is the Rensen. There's a whole bunch of buildings around this big central hotel, right? And when you go to work in the morning, right, especially in the winter time, right, by the time you get there, because it's an OEM and they like you there being at 7, 7.30, it's dark. And you're in these buildings that are probably about, about 40 stories tall around this building that is 75 stories tall, and I had a cube at the time, right, that faced the hotel, and the hotel has windows, and I can tell you at 7.30 in the morning there are many, many opportunities to invade other people's privacy in hotel rooms because they think they're way up way, way high and they don't realize that there's a bunch of buildings there, right? It's the same thing in our IoT world, right? So think about when all of my sensors know where I am, know what I'm doing, right? A good example that we have today um, that some people either realize or don't, I'm always kind of confused whether, right, you guys are probably smarter than the average bear, but I happen to have an Android phone, right? And I like the fact that I have tracking on. So for example, it knows when I look at the weather, it knows that I'm looking at the weather here because that's what I care about. It knows, it can call an Uber for me and it knows where I'm at. I mean, there's all kinds of things that tracking is, is good for. Um, 
if any of you have an Android phone and you've connected it to your Google account, try going to maps.google.com, right? And then go to, to uh, location history. And what it will do is it will bring up your location history for every place that your phone has been at least, which is probably every place that you've been, in a really cool map. Like last year, right? During this month, every place I went. Now, I'm, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, so my thing is, and I, and I watch uh, Law and Order all the time, and so I'm convinced now at least when I say I couldn't have murdered this guy because I was in California, I can show him this map that shows that I'm in California, so that's kind of a positive part about it, and I'll turn it off if I decide I want to do something bad. Um, but we are being tracked that way, but imagine all of your sensors are tracking you, right? So, so that's one, right? And it's not Internet of Thing, it's Internet of Things. So now what I have is I have sensors on my house, right? One of the things that, uh, that uh, is an interesting use case is imagine that you had a sensor in your house that based upon the temperature outside and the forecast and whether it was raining, it could open or close the windows in your house in order to keep your house cooler. That'd be nice, right? Unfortunately, what it means is I now have an actuator in my house that can open and close my windows. Right? And I have sensors that know whether I'm home or whether I'm not home. It knows whether it's raining. There's a lot of information that gets put out that, right, right, that privacy information, right? It is the virtual equivalent of me being in the building next door and peeking through the hotel room window, this ability to be able to communicate back and forth, right? And then in the end of it, you know how this will be solved. And by the way, organizations like mine, who provide secure connectivity solutions for these Internet of Things and people, we love regulatory compliance. Because the way things get solved are two things. First, standards organizations say we're going to create a single standard, right? Which we all know the old joke, right? The great thing about standards that I love is the fact there's so many to choose from. There won't be a single standard, right? The proof I know that there won't be a single standard is whether you guys know it or not, there is an IR standard that was created in 1972 right, for controlling remote devices. Nobody still has one remote control that controls everything in their house because nobody wants to follow the standard, right? And then the second thing that happens is the government decides that they will create legal rules or regulation associated to what you have to do or not have to do, which ends up becoming onerous and requires you to rewrite everything because now you have to be able to monitor uh, uh, those sorts of things. So those are kind of the things at least that, that we see. Our observations, though, are this. Point-to-point -point access is bound to fail, right? And, it's, and the reason it's going to fail, I'm not even going to use the we're not smart enough to figure it out, all of that, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of do the, 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 the thing that uh, security guys say, right? Trust the math. It's going to fail, right, because of the 2 to the n minus 1 rule, right? And if you guys, right, know that rule, Right? In general, what it means is if you have 10 devices that are point-to-point -point connected and you add one more device and you do point-to-point, -point, right, you add well over 100 connections. If what you do is a hub-and-spoke model and you add one device, you add one connection. Hackers love connections. The more endpoints and the more endpoint interaction, the better because it allows them to do right, something that, is, that, you know, that, that basically is, is privilege escalation. So what I do is I find the least secure thing in your life, much like hackers do with IDs, right? that Dilbert commercial or Dilbert cartoon, for example. So I find the sensor that is outside of your house right, that is doing nothing more than measuring whether it's raining and how hot it is to determine if it can open up the windows. Right? You, that sensor's Manufacturer's attitude is, who cares about that? Everyone knows what the temperature outside is anyway. I hack that sensor. I escalate to the sensor that is in the house that uh, is my nest. I escalate from there to something else. I escalate from there to something else. I mean, this is the way that hackers, hackers work. Imagine that everything had to go to a central point, right, in order to be able to do that, that connection, to do that escalation. Now, the advantage of a central point is that you move the decision command and control into the cloud. And I'm going to get to that in my second thing. And I hate the fact I said the word. I'm not going to say it one more time. Uh, we move it into a central point in the network. 
right? I am not saying that uh, our implementations and central points are great, they're not, but they're fixable in one place, right? If you have 22 million devices out there, nobody is updating them. The best, and by the way, you think vehicles are a good example? I got, how, how many people here have a wireless router in their house? How many people here immediately upon buying that wireless router um, re-imaged it with, uh, with an open source uh, router protocol? Yeah, like two. Uh, all the rest of you, your routers are all compromised. I have news for you, there are more vulnerabilities in router software than you can imagine, and, and the folks from Linksys and that have zero interest in updating those. They want you to buy the new, the new routers, right? That's, that's the way it works, right? My phone from Verizon has the vulnerability in it, right, which is the MMS vulnerability, well-formed MMS, right, can you take my phone over? That vulnerability is still on my phone. That vulnerability was uh, fixed by Google. That vulnerability is still on my phone. Why? Because Verizon has no interest at all in pushing me a new update. Now, the new phone I'm gonna get next week will not have that vulnerability, and they're very happy for me to get a new phone. So, so, don't make the assumption that those endpoints, right, are going to end up being secure. And if I know that the endpoints aren't secure, if I assume endpoints aren't secure, then point to point is bound to fail, not just because of the two to the n minus one problem, but because of the fact I will always have vulnerable endpoints because in the end, money is gonna win off over security in, in some of those things. The second thing is, and this I just like putting in all my presentations, to intelligent folks. We have to stop using the word cloud. I hate it. You understand it was invented by a marketing group. In reality, what we have is we have a distributed network topology, right, of which a thing called the internet is part of it, of which there are intranets that are part of it, of which there are firewalls, right? It is distributed in that the endpoints are smart nodes, right? I know that's complicated, but we've decided to call it the cloud. The problem is the cloud has now been imbibed with many, many magical properties, right? So why would you want to run that system yourself? Do it in the cloud, right? That data is not secure in your computer. Put it in the cloud, right? The cloud in and of itself adds no security at all. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but it, it makes this assumption that there is this ubiquitous big thing that isn't truly a ubiquitous big thing. It also makes us believe that we have to use new techniques when in reality, right, anyone here who's old enough to remember something called distributed computing environment, right, DCE, right, right, in those days, that's what we have, right? DCE used this great thing called Kerberos, right, which was a ticketing system that created an encrypted ticket for you to allow you to go to a security service and be able to consume things, gosh, Web service calls with SAML association, it's the same stuff. We can learn from the same sort of thing, right? Um, federation alone is not the answer. In a federated model, decisions are always made every time. In the IoT model, I'm gonna have to do something what, uh, which I call, kind of call elongated federation, right? And what that is is that sometimes you will get a token that will have duration, either based on time or utilization. So the example is, if I have to ask permission every time to do something, and let's say that I have two action tokens. One is the start my car token, and the second one is the mute my radio token, right? So, so for example, my uh, navigation system wants to get the mute the radio token for the purpose of being able to mute the radio when it's saying, no, dude, turn left here, and the start your car token is something my phone would like to have so it can start my car. The start my car token is probably a single use token. Every time you want to start the car, you got to ask for a new token. If you don't follow the rules, you don't get a new token. You get to use it once, you get to use it only once within a short period of time. The mute my phone token, I don't want to be talking to the cloud all the time. How about it's good for a month or a week or a year? I don't know, right? It is something like that, right? It's an extended use federation model, right? And then as I told you, right, standards do not mean simplified implementation. Um, sometimes because there's lots of them, Sometimes because a lot of standards bodies uh, are consensus, as I think our last speaker talked about. And so if anyone has ever looked at the, the whole SAML spec, 
Um, it's huge. It's unimplementable, right? Nobody could ever implement the whole SAML spec. You, you pick bits and pieces of it. It doesn't make it simpler, right? In many cases, it makes it more complex because you're trying to solve every single possible problem, right? So I said I would talk about some critical installation things, right? So we do some stuff for the energy industry, right? The argument that I have about critical infrastructure is the Internet have th of things, right? As long as we use the same internet protocols we use today, right? Meaning we're gonna use a public internet, right? We're not gonna go down the path of creating multiple internets, which I'd love to have a discussion with. I really do think maybe the, the uh, uh, well, let's just put it this way. Uh, the military has decided that having three networks is a good idea. There's the internet, there's Nippernet, and there's Sippernet. Those are three completely separate networks. And by the way, Sippernet is truly air-gapped. And by air-gapped, it means they can't, you can't communicate out uh, at all. Um, uh, maybe we should think about the idea of having a critical network infrastructure, a healthcare infrastructure that is truly a separate IP network address, set of addresses of which there is no communication. A lot of problems with that. I don't think that's going to happen. If that doesn't happen, and we move forward the way that we've planned to move forward, okay, the way that, that a lot of the new uh, uh, items, so the new GM vehicles, for example, when you turn your car on, right, same with Hyundai, same with Toyota, you get an IP address. Your vehicle is network addressable, right? In the old days, when you turned on a GM car, it was a CDMA connection to a back end, it was non-routable protocol, you had to go through a gateway, right? That may not have made it 100% secure, but you couldn't go directly to the car. Things are going to be internet routable. IPv6 is gonna mean we're gonna have billions of IP addresses each, right? Um, and so the problem is everything is critical infrastructure now. Everything is, right? Right? If I can do escalation, I can probably find my way anywhere at all, right? It's like going back to that building, right? I can find a way in, right? You know, the old saying is a confident walk and a clipboard will get you into any secure building in the United States, right? There are things like that in the hacker world, right, that are very similar. The other thing I just want to leave you with, right, is by having a centralized hub model that basically goes in, not only do I get privacy capability, so I, I have a, or not only do I get security capability, single place to go, right, to do not just manage identities, I wanna stop saying the word identity management, I wanna start saying the word identity orchestration, right? Management of identities means a LDAP database where I know all the identities. Orchestration says I know what those identities can do based upon the time frame, what they've done in the past, how it is they react, all of those sorts, sorts of things, right? So I have the ability to do that. But it also means I can do a thing called obfuscation. So maybe it's important for General Motors to know what all the sensors in my vehicle are doing in a fairly real-time manner. They just don't need to know it's my vehicle, right? All they really care about is that, right, what I have is a, is a 2015, right, Sierra 2500 with a Duramax diesel in it. They don't need to know it's me. They don't need to know any of that sort of stuff. When you put third parties in the middle, you can obfuscate that. So they can still have their big data to do cool stuff, right? But they don't need to know who that, that person is. The thing about de-identification, though, is sometimes you want to be able to do re-identification. So, there is anonymization. That means you will never know who I am. I'm completely and totally anonymous within reason. And then there's de-identification, which says, I'm going to send on some sort of mnemonic for you as a third-party intermediary. But if it turns out that after monitoring your car, I realize it's going to blow up in like the next three days, maybe I would like to re-identify you so I could send you an email to say, dude, you have to go now, right, to the dealership because it's a bad thing, right? So having a third party in the middle, right? So right, imagine a model where instead of this whole type of mesh network, what you do is you have a model where you have a rules engine that sits in the middle that has the ability to decide when data needs to be shared, doesn't need to be shared, where those identities are, how they orchestrate, 
based upon what happens in the ecosystem, which by the way is now all of the things associated with me, not just me, because it happens automatically, has that ability to be able to make those decisions in real time and be patched in one place. And that really is kind of the, uh, well, as I said in this one, right, on that exciting note, that is the end of my part of the presentation. So if there's any questions, I don't have any answers. <laughs> so I just made it all up. Remember, I nuked all the slides. Right here. So as you look at, um, a, 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 like I hate to use best practice, but if you had to tell us what we should be doing in the next two to five years to federate, to identify, you know, how, how are you looking at security? What are you, what are you telling your customers, your IoT, whatever? Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, the customers that we have, so in one of them, right, so our biggest IoT customers right now are the uh, OEMs. And uh, what we're telling them, and honestly, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm getting a lot of pushback, is I am telling them to make their vehicles dumber, not smarter. Right, so today's model, and we've talked about this, it's, you know, we want to put intrusion detection in the vehicle, we want to put all kinds of things in this vehicle, right, right, and all we're really doing is we're saying the processing power in the vehicle is going to be bigger, there's going to be more and more and more and more and more code running in the vehicle, right, and, and I do agree, I don't care, right, once you put millions and millions of lines of code in, someone's going to make a mistake, there will be an attack vector, there always is, they always find something, it's not because of bad coding, it's because of, of, of smart folks, right. What if you make the vehicle dumber and dumber and dumber? Move more of the decision making into a third party connected hub, or not third party, your own party connected hub, right? Make the vehicle dependent upon, or the thing, dependent upon that to do anything. And there's technologies that are well known, right, to be able to do that. Um, so that what you do is when the hackers find the vulnerability in the, in the the central hub implementation, which they will also, because they're very smart, you just apply a patch in that central hub implementation, you turn off that capability, you do whatever, right? So that has been, you know, our push is that idea, right, of move that outside of the vehicle. Don't assume you're going to know what in five years people are gonna wanna do or not wanna do with those things. So from your GM days and, and Cobison, how are you dealing with this constellation of partners, right? One thing I see is it's almost like you have to get a group of partners together and I don't want to call it a stack, but the best way to think about it, in my view, is it's a stack and, and they all have to agree to a standard, a principle, or something. Do you see that happening and, and are you recommending that to those, uh, that constellation of partners? How are you, how are you managing yeah. partners in yeah. ecosystem? Um, not very well. Uh, uh, I'm in complete agreement with you that this is the hardest uh, is the hardest thing, right? What is interesting is looking at the model um, of again coming having coming from come from GM, right? They have partners, right? They don't make their own brake. Brakes are really important in cars. General Motors does not manufacture its own brakes, right? They buy their brakes from third parties, right? They have testing procedures. They go through stuff. They obviously have right. If you think about things, I mean like things like brakes. They have standard interfaces, right? It's there's a bolt at uh, three quarters of an inch and a bolt here, and that's the standard interface, and this is what you have to do. We have to get better at that to say there are standard interfaces between parts. So from that standpoint, those kind of partners, right? But there, and I think we can manage that, right? I honestly believe, right? So for example, I don't write my own SSL stack, right? I right now I either use OpenSSL, right, or, or or something else. I don't write my own operating system, right? And those partners basically provide patches. We have a way of dealing with it, right? Is it perfect? It's not. But we're never going to have somebody write the whole thing, right? The only people I know who write from top to bottom like that are like NASA and JPL and, and those folks. Those aren't the partners that concern me, right? And this isn't an IoT discussion as much as it really is this whole idea right now of SOA architectures. Now what I do is I create a platform and I let third parties write on top of it right, their own stuff that they sell, right? How is it that I manage those third party partners who are developing on top of my stack that sits in, in the, on the internet as opposed to, to otherwise? And that's a challenge, honestly, it's a challenge because, you know, it's this whole idea, right, of risk management, 
right? I can be the security guy who says no to everything, and we will be very secure. As soon as we go out of business, we'll be even more secure, right? <laughs> or I can be the security guy who says yes to all the right things, um, uh, uh, that sort of thing, right? And I kind of look at that security thing. One of the thing is, and I think people here are a lot of security guys, and this is good, and maybe you've heard this one, but it's an, it's an automotive security blended uh, uh, sort of, uh, of deal, right? So, you know, so everybody here knows what the, the function of brakes on a car is. The function of brakes on a car is to stop your car. The purpose of brakes on a car is to let you go fast. The function of security professionals is to stop bad guys from going out. Their purpose is to let you share information and connect devices. And that's the thing that we have to get. We, if, if anyone else here is a big security geek and plays that role, we have to get out of this idea that it is our job to protect the organization from anything. It's our job to enable the organization to do things they never thought they could do. I think that's a great point to end on. Wonderful talk. Thank you.